Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Bell, and I'm the Vice Chancellor at the University of Reading. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you this evening to the Walker Institute Annual Lecture for 2014. The importance of engagement between the academic community and the wider community is one which will be uh, an argument that is probably well made in this audience. We take it very seriously at the University of Reading and indeed is something that we wish to encourage. One area where the University excels, of course, is climate and environmental sciences, an area where engagement and the application of research is vital. The Walker Institute, established by the University to harness our climate expertise, is intending to develop and has developed already the integration of research and engagement with stakeholders from business, government and the wider society. In a moment, I'm going to introduce Nigel Arnell, who is the Walker Institute Director. A brief word, however, about our speaker ahead of Nigel's more formal introduction. It's my great pleasure to welcome Mark Walport, somebody that I've had the pleasure to work with in previous roles. And Mark, we're delighted to have you here this evening. But it's now my pleasure to introduce Nigel Arnell, the Walker Institute Director. Right, well, thank you very much, and I'd like to add my welcome to you all to this year's Walker Institute Annual Lecture. The Walker Institute was established at the University of Reading in 2006 to draw together the university's expertise across the wide range of disciplines involved in research into climate change and its consequences. The Institute seeks to encourage new interdisciplinary research and also to work with a wide range of stakeholders who have an interest in and a need for robust and objective evidence on climate change and its consequences. We're not just interested in doing the science, we're interested in how we can use the science to guide our future. And I'm committed to ensuring that the University of Reading's real world-class research into climate and its consequences has a significant impact on policy and practice. Communication, engagement and dialogue are particularly important and we therefore launched the annual lecture series in 2009 each year we've set a theme and used the lecture as a stimulus for discussion, both before and after the event itself. We started in 2009 with Bob Watson, who was then the DEFRA chief scientist and had previously been the co-chair of the IPCC, and he talked on science, climate science for policy uh, purposes. We followed that with Rowan Douglas from Willis Reinsurance on climate science for business and then Rowan Sutton from NCAS Climate on climate science and risk assessment. In 2012, Chris Whitty, who was DFID's chief scientist, gave a really thought-provoking talk on climate science and development, the links between si uh, climate, climate change, development and adaptation. And last year, Lord Krebs from the Adaptation Subcommittee spoke on the UK's progress with adaptation to climate change and where the science gaps and the science needs were. I'm delighted that Sir Mark Warport has agreed to present our lecture this year. The communication of climate science has been particularly prominent this year, what with the recent IPCC reports um, published in 2013 and, and earlier this year, and discussions around new international and national climate policy. I'm sure many of you are aware that Sir Mark has been quite vocal on this, and I'm sure that the lecture today will be really quite stimulating and dis stimulate discussion about how we can best communicate climate science, climate research to help inform um, policy. Sir Mark is the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Government, a position he took up in April 2013, following a long and distinguished career in medicine, specialising in immunology and the genetics of rheumatic diseases. And prior to that, he was a director of the Wellcome Institute, uh, sorry, the Wellcome Trust. Um, so he received a knighthood in 2009 for services to medical research. So I'm pleased to welcome Sir Mark Warport to give this year's Walker Institute annual lecture. Thank you very much indeed. It's an honour to be asked to give this lecture. Um, I'm tempted to say that the summary of the talk to this title is yes. Um, um, and I think the answer is a bit of both and certainly a work in progress. A great deal of my job 
is about communication. Um, and you might well say, and others indeed have said, um, what is a medical scientist doing talking about climate change? Um, but of course, anyone who is a chief scientist, a scientific advisor in government, has his or her own area of expertise in science. But what is important is that we all have an expertise in the principles of the scientific method, in evidence gathering, in statistics, in the rigor of the process, an understanding of how science proceeds, and importantly, I think, how science is communicated. And a great part of my job is about communicating science from one expert community to sometimes other expert communities, but more frequently within government. And my job is to be able to ask scientists the difficult questions, to be able to quiz them where I think there's lack of clarity, and to be able to provide clarity in my communications to the government. Um, and not surprisingly, one of the things that I've spent an enormous amount of time during my first year in post is around climate and climate science and climate communications. Now, the job of the government chief scientist is to advise government on all aspects of science, engineering, technology, and social science for all aspects of government policy. So it's a sort of narrowly defined job description. And how can one encapsulate that and turn it into a sort of a, a strategy for how to do the job? And if you think about the things that government should really care about, they're really sort of twofold. There's the health, the well-being, the resilience, and the security of the population. And there's something which is intimately interlinked with that, which is the economy. And what is it that determines our health, our well-being, our resilience, and our security? It is actually our infrastructure. And in respect to this lecture, there are two absolutely key infrastructures on which we depend. Um, and the first one is the power, uh, the energy that powers this building. And we know that advanced societies stop working very rapidly if we lose our electricity supply, for example. And so it is our infrastructure that we take for granted that actually provides a lot of our security, our resilience, etc. Um, and you can divide that infrastructure into two. Our built, our engineered, our technological infrastructure. And so energy is very important in that hierarchy. Transport, the built environment, cybersecurity increasingly. Um, and then there is the natural environment, which again, we sadly tend to take for granted. And that includes um, our health, human health, animal health, plant health, but it also includes our weather and the climate. And so if you think about those in relation to important issues for, the, for a government chief scientist, then energy and climate, which are of course inextricably linked one to the other, and the economy, where my role is to bring together uh, science, engineering, technology, and social science between academia, industry, and government, you can see why it's such an important topic and such an important topic for all of us, and why I've spent so much time learning about it and communicating it. Now, as uh, David has just said, a lot of what I'm talking about today is actually about communication between scientific communities and publics of different sorts. And of course, there is no one public. We are all the public. Um, but I might just preface my remarks by saying something about communication between and amongst scientists. Um, because a great deal of science is funded by the public in one form or another, either through the taxpayer or through philanthropic endeavors. And it's extremely important that we maximize the impact of that science. And of course, one key way to maximize the impact of science is to maximize its distribution. And so in my previous job at the Wellcome Trust, we were very passionate about the importance of open access. And the Genome Project, which was an example of a global scientific collaboration, was particularly special, not only because of an extraordinary technological scientific achievement in its own right, but because there was open communication of the data. 
And I think that that is as critical in other walks of science. And it is really important that climate science is open, that the results and the data are made widely available so that all of us have the opportunity to both interpret them and sadly, in some cases, misinterpret them. But I don't think that's any excuse for a lack of openness. And so I think that that's an important part of the communication, which actually within and amongst and between the scientific community and from the scientific community to the outside world, we must be as open as we possibly can in our science. And I don't say that in a sort of preachy way to climate science. I say it to science as a whole. I think this is important in all walks of science. It, is, it should be, um, as is the title of a Royal Society report, science as an open enterprise. Um, so turning to the substance of my talk, which is about communication with broader audiences, um, it's always worth thinking when you communicate about why you're communicating and to whom you're communicating. Um, and a theme which will come up through the report is that, uh, through my talk rather, is that this is a two-way process. Um, so we communicate to inform. This is a large and important, indeed an interesting area of science. And so it's important that we communicate to inform. But this is an area of science that is in the public domain, there's an enormous amount of public interest in it, and therefore it's also important that we respond to misinformation as well. And I think that's a critical part of all science communication, actually. Um, but of course, coming back to... Um, oops, I've jumped the slide, sorry. Yeah, that was my first slide, sorry. Um, coming back to uh, being government chief scientist, because these topics are so important to governments around the world, and there are all sorts of policy decisions that need to be made around our energy supply, around how we deal with the challenges that are faced by climate change, uh, we also communicate climate science uh, within government and publicly to aid discussions about policy and decision making. And the role of the scientific advisor is not to actually make the policies. The people that make the policies are the people that we elect in democratically elected governments. Um, my job and the job of the scientific community at large is actually to provide the scientific evidence that's necessary to help policymakers make their decisions. And I'll come on to the different lenses that policymakers, politicians use when they're looking at topics such as energy. Um, and of course, because this is a globally important topic, um, there is an enormous depth of information. And I nearly brought along um, the uh, first of the current batch of IPCC reports, uh, the physical science basis, um, because you need uh, to be physical in another way to carry this thing. It weighs about three kilograms. Um, but there is an enormous volume of literature out there. And one of the great things about the IPCC process, though I'll come back to it in a little while as a communication tool, is that it is, this is an area of science which has gone through the most extraordinary meta-analysis as well. Um, and that's something that I'm very familiar with from the world of medicine that it is extremely rare that a single piece of scientific research gives you the complete answer to a scientific question. Science proceeds, it's about reducing uncertainty through experimentation and observation. Um, and the extraordinary thing about climate science is that because it is such an important topic, um, it has gone through probably more stringent meta-analysis than any other area of science that there's ever been in human endeavor. And it's a process that, in a way, I think started in medicine, where medics recognize that we take life and death decisions based on treatment choices, and therefore evidence-based medicine, and who would like the alternative, really, does need to proceed on the basis of analysis of all the data that's available. And that was where I think meta-analysis really started in science. Um, so we need to communicate climate science to inform, to counter misinformation, to aid in policy making, and of course, to empower each of us in terms of uh, individual uh, decision making. Uh, decisions about how we use power, um, how we 
um, and, and many of the things, of course, that we can do which will reduce our own carbon footprints are things that will be good for our health as well. There, so there are co-benefits from reducing carbon emissions. And in many parts of the world, uh, fuel, organic fuel, is still burnt in open dwellings, or open in dwellings, and that is a tremendous cause of respiratory disease. And by burning the fuel more efficiently, burning it in closed systems, we can actually reduce carbon emissions and also reduce respiratory disease. So actually what's good for the environment is frequently good for our health as well. Um, though, as any doctor knows, uh, telling people, exhorting people to change their behaviour is very challenging. Um, and it's very easy to say someone who is, to someone who is obese, you need to eat less and exercise more. But we all know how hard that is to do in reality. So, what about where we are in uh, science communication? And of course the truth is that climate change is one of the science topics that people actually feel most well informed about. Um, and so from the Public Attitudes to Science Survey of 2014, um, the, um, the green bar, the dark green bar, is the percentage of people who feel informed about a topic. Um, the lighter green is the percentage of at least heard of the topic, um, and the red is the percentage that don't feel informed. And in the sort of feeling informed uh, section, then climate change actually comes in that 99% of people have heard about it, and 78% uh, feel informed. Um, so it's, there has been a lot of communication in this space, and it actually tops the polls, as it were, as the science topic that people feel most well informed by, um, followed closely by vaccination, um, then renewable energy, which of course is in the same topic area, um, economics and the way the economy works, people feel, um, well, they, they've heard about it, they feel less informed. Um, I'm not quite sure where I would put myself on this particular one. <laughs> um, the use of animals in research, nuclear power, GM crops, clinical trials, and then we get down to nanotechnology and synthetic biology. And this is a survey of uh, just over 1,700 adults in the UK aged more than 16. So people start uh, pretty well informed. Um, but there's, of course, a difference between feeling informed and actually feeling comfortable that you understand what the implications of the knowledge are. Um, and so if you start looking at it in terms of nuances, and I'm grateful for a lot of this work, to the work of uh, people such as Nick Pigeon and his colleagues in Cardiff, who've done a lot on public engagement, um, their work has shown that people might be concerned about climate change, they think it's happening, but there's a significant fraction that still think it's just all natural variation. Um, others view it as a distant problem which affects other people and other times. Um, other people recognize the effects that it may be warmer, that there may be more melting of glaciers, melting of the Arctic um, ice, but don't spontaneously connect these with human causes uh, with energy use or deforestation. And of course one of the big challenges of electricity is that it's something that comes out of a plug in the wall and we don't think about much about what happens proximal uh, to the um, electricity coming out of the plugs. Um, and there is a tendency to confuse climate change with lots of other environmental issues. And what's I think interesting is that if you look over time then actually there is a decline in people's confidence in the causation of climate change. And so if we look back over three methodologically very similar surveys conducted in the UK between 2005 and last year, you can see that in 2005, uh, in response to the question, as far as you know, do you personally think the world's climate is changing or not? Then the figure was 91% yes in 2005, with 4% saying no and 5% don't know. Um, in 2010, um, it had fallen to 78%, and in 2013, so just last year, the figure was 72% yes, 19% no, and 9% don't know. And the other thing that's changed is the level of concern about climate change amongst the public. So in 2005, almost everyone recognised that it was happening, uh, but about 82% were concerned. And by 2013, 60% of people were concerned. 
Now, I don't think we really know the explanation for this change. Um, and what I would say is that if you look at this in terms of voting figures, uh, then most politicians would be rather happy with 72%. Um, but leaving that aside, there are probably three explanations, none of which are mutually exclusive. The first is that a sense of sort of boredom. In other words, this issue has been around a long time. People have been talking about it a long time. Nothing really seems to have changed. Um, what are they all going on about? Um, the second factor is probably... Uh, a change in the economy and people worry about energy affordability their energy bills they worry about the uncertainty in the cost of new technologies and again that drives a particular set of thoughts and the third is that there is a very broad um, media response um, and there are skeptical views that people listen to as well and there's probably no single answer as to the explanation for the difference between these um, uh, statistics over time, and I suspect that all three factors are playing along. Uh, but nevertheless, it is still the case that a vast majority of, public, of the public do recognise that there is climate change, that there is an important anthrop anthropogenic component to it, and they are concerned about it. Now, of course, the other question when one's communicating is that we are in, I think everyone would recognise that we are in a world where, uh, if I'd been giving this lecture a few years ago, there wouldn't have been a Twitter hashtag. Um, and so the means of communication are changing. Um, but perhaps not as much as we might think. Um, so this, um, uh, from, uh, uh, again, the Public Attitudes to Science survey, ask the question about where people get their information about. And television news programs, the television still predominates. Um, but the blue bars that you see here are um, the um, all adults aged over 16. Um, the gray bar underneath it is amongst 16 to 24 year olds. And you can see, perhaps not surprisingly, in that segment of the population that a smaller number are getting their information from the television and a much smaller proportion from print newspapers, 11% um, as compared to 23% uh, for the generation of most of the people in this room. Um, and a much higher fraction, 21%, are getting their information from social networks uh, compared with only 6% amongst the whole population. Um, and we can also see that this is a topic that is of very broad global interest, because if you look and ask the question of Google, um, what's the list of the top 10 most searched what is questions in 2013, um, then what is global warming comes out at eighth. So we're not communicating with an audience that is completely uninterested. There is an enormous amount of curiosity about global warming. And of course, one of the things that we do have to embrace, and I'll come back to this nearer the end, are the opportunities for digital media, which provide new opportunities for engagement between scientists and the public. And this is really starting to be limited only by people's imagination in terms of the new tools uh, for communication. This um, piece of data, or these data, I think are quite interesting because they show um, the half-life of online conversations uh, throughout um, 2013. So this is um, looking between January and December 2013 um, at online conversations and you can sort of see the news events of the year in the world of science according to the spikes of activity. Um, and you can see that in fact the winner um, by a, a short head, if I may put it that way, <laughs> uh, was horse meat. Um, and you can see a couple of spikes. And I mean, this is a very interesting new way of uh, gathering um, information about crowdsourcing information about public concerns and public interests. Um, and you can see that the Russian meteor uh, caused a brief spike of activity. Um, you can see a brief spike on GM food, um, badgers, climate change, of course, corresponding exactly to the first working group report from the IPCC. Um, but the half-life of these spikes is extremely short. 
Um, and in fact, if you look at these spikes in relation to other activities, you see that this is still a relatively small part of people's concerns in the Twitter sphere, at any rate. And some analysis, I'm sorry, there's rather too many words on this slide, but some analysis of the social listening, I think, does provide some insight for those that are interested in online science engagement. Um, and again, not surprisingly, I think, discussion of science issues online frequently takes place amongst those who are already engaged, who actually start by holding strong views. Um, and the reality is that the most animated Twitter uh, debates probably don't reach very many people who are not already interested and already, if you like, part of that social network of followers and followed, who, which develops in any area of um, interest. Um, and indeed, if you look at much online debate, and I think it's perhaps not surprising with Twitter where you haven't got very many words in which to express your opinion, uh, it tends to be extremely partisan. Um, so people usually cite a, a scientific evidence in the context of shoring up either an ethical or a political argument. Um, and of course, who the messenger matters greatly as well, and I'll come on to the messenger in just a moment. Um, but a lot of it boiled down to discussions of scientific authority. Um, and of course, I think many of us would argue that actually one of the important features of the IPCC is the depth of academic authority that does go with it. This is many of the most eminent climate scientists in the world, of the scientists who know about meteorology, um, and they are, it is a very rigorous meta-analysis process. Um, but what is accepted within the scientific community may not be accepted in the community at large. And again, not surprisingly, really, trust is highest in organizations that are seen to be independent. Um, and a lot of the online conversation, of course, is actually messages that direct you to other sources of information, either online sources or traditional media. And of course, one of the most powerful uses of Twitter is as a come here message. It actually is a way of directing someone to something much more substantive. Um, and of course, the other thing is, and this is a good example of a slide that doesn't work for that, uh, communications that's visually interesting, humorous, or relevant to people's daily lives is generally more effective. Uh, so this slide definitely gets a fail. Um, and of course, the messenger does matter. Um, and this is uh, uh, work of Emily Shukbur and others. Um, and this is looking over time. This is from a series of surveys going back to 2006 and ending in 2011. Um, and asking the question about who, which authority groups do you trust to give correct information on climate change? Um, and independent scientists uh, come out as the most trusted. Um, environmental groups, the second. Um, there, there's a, it's interesting, there's a decline, a secular decline over time in that. Uh, government scientists, so I do less well because I'm no longer an independent scientist associated with the Wellcome Trust. I have metamorphosed into a different species. Um, I trusted a bit less. Um, and then um, the government sits pretty much at the same level as government scientists. Um, the media a little bit behind that, uh, business and industry behind, and a significant fraction who don't really trust anyone. Um, but I think there's another important point, and it's a point that uh, Baroness and Nora and Neil often makes, which is actually trust is specific, it's not generic. And she uses the example of journalism, um, and the question is, do you trust the journalist to tell you the football score? And the answer is, of course you do. And so trust is very context specific. And a scientist who's talking about the Higgs boson is much more likely to be trusted, even if they can't be understood, than a scientist who's talking about uh, GM foods or pesticides. So trust is very context specific. And we always need to beware of people who make general statements about trust. Um, and of course, political messages also matter as well. Um, and here is uh, the Prime Minister visiting uh, the flooding, and uh, the quote is, colleagues across the House can argue about whether that's linked to climate change or not. I very much suspect it is. But the political discourse is also very important as part of the communication. 
But of course, at the end of the day, if we are going to communicate effectively, we do need to understand the audience. And I think this slide from Rank Maniac uh, gets it quite nicely, which is that there is a tendency that one group of people have something that they want to say, and they're actually talking to an audience who really wants to hear something completely different or from a different angle. And of course, what you have to maximize is that area of relevance in between the two. Um, otherwise, uh, you will be shouting at the sleeping. Um, and of course, the framing of things matters greatly as well. Um, whether your cup is half full or half empty matters greatly. And the message which simply says it's all doom and gloom, the world is going to end in 60 years, um, is not a very effective um, form of communication. And here's some work again from Emily Shukborough. If you say the world is going to end, people switch off thinking, here they go again trying to sell us something. And so the context in which we frame our communications is extremely important. And framing it in terms of the positive messages about the technologies, the technological opportunities, the ability to do something is going to be much more effective than framing it in the context of, you know, it's all awful, there's nothing we can do. And I think another interesting point is, and this comes back to something I want to say a little bit more about, is that locality-specific information probably has much more resonance to most people than much more generic. And so the work of the Royal Society working with the um, Academy of, uh, of US National Academy of Sciences, which was as were much more local than a whole IPCC report, which was global, probably has more resonance. And there's the recent report, which just came out in the last week or two, climate change impacts in the United States. And so we mustn't assume that because there is this definitive global report, the IPCC report, that's going to have as much impact as communication which is more tailored to local environments. Now, this, I think, is an important point, and I think it's an important challenge in both the analysis and the communication of climate science. And it's the problem of causation and correlation. And so our perception of future risk is very dramatically influenced by our short-term experiences. And so here's some work from uh, DEFRA, from Ipsos Mori, and AEA Technology in 2013. And this was a survey that was done between January and February of 2013. Um, so looking at floods before that. Um, and the question was asked, um, uh, during your life in the UK, do you feel the following have become more or less frequent in the UK or stayed about the same? And how likely, if at all, do you personally think it is that the following will have become more common in the UK by 2050? And you see flooding and periods of heavy rainfall, which this survey immediately followed, as coming out absolutely top of the pile. You see cold erosion, you see mild winters and cold winters, dry periods, and then you see heat waves and hot summers right down at the bottom of the list. So when you ask the question, and this again shows the similar data in another way, um, which is um, how serious a problem do you think the following currently are for the UK, or don't you think they're a problem at all? And then question 11 is how likely, if at all, do you personally think it is that the following will have become more common in the UK by 2050? Then you see um, an extraordinarily good, almost a sort of physicist correlation rather than a biologist correlation, where you've got a correlation of 0.93. Actually, I'm being very unfair to physicists who would normally expect sort of 0.9999, but um, nevertheless, it's less than most biological correlations. And so, the, 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 non, the serious point here is that people do tend to, when they're thinking about climate, tend to immediately associate it with their recent experiences of weather. And I think that is one of the big challenges in the communication of climate science. Um, language matters as well. Um, and so we tend to use words which then um, get interpreted in a um, different way. And this is from a, a, an article in Physics Today, um, where aerosol um, in the sort of context of climate means tiny atmospheric particles, where most people talk about aerosols, they think of spray cans. Um, a positive trend um, 
to most people means a good trend um, as opposed to an upward trend. Um, positive feedback um, is praise, um, good response as opposed to potentially a vicious or self-reinforcing cycle. Um, um, when we talk about um, uncertainty, well, sometimes people take, take that to mean ignorance, although actually uncertainty means we don't know. Um, um, errors are mistakes, they're wrong, they're incorrect, as opposed to the sort of scientific interpretation of error, and I could go through this. A scheme is a devious plot, as opposed to a systematic plan. A manipulation is definitely illicit tampering, um, and an anomaly is an abnormal occurrence. And when people talk about negative emissions in terms of carbon capture, I really think that we're failing to communicate amongst ourselves, let alone with anyone else. Um, so I think we do need to think about the language, but I also think we need to bear in mind Einstein's famous quote, which is that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And getting the narrative right, I think, is very important. And Lazarevitz from Yale has argued that climate change communication should contain five key messages. And those messages are that climate change is happening, we're causing it, it's likely to be bad, um, and that the scientific community overwhelmingly agree on the first three points. And then there are things which can be done. And I'm sure we can debate and I'm well aware, looking out at this audience, that there are many very distinguished climate scientists in this audience, but we can debate a little bit whether those are the correct um, narrative. And again, um, uh, from the focus work of, of um, Shukbra, I almost feel like a lot of people writing newspapers nowadays have forgotten the art of storytelling, telling where they are, telling you what's going on in the middle, and concluding. Um, and that is important, so we need to be able to communicate. It needs a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and I've learned from my talks, and one of the things I did a few months ago was I talked in a number of science centres, about half a dozen around the UK, about climate change and about some of the energy challenges that we face. And the interesting feedback that I got um, was, and here are just three quotes, um, I would have been interested in hearing more on the how do we respond to climate change side of things. As a citizen, I want to know how the science knowledge can be, made, can be used to make good policy. My only comment was that I knew much of it already, although I did learn a few new specifics. And then another one, small sections relating to actions that could be taken, but this section wasn't long enough. And I think it comes back to the point I made on the previous slide, that actually the narrative does need to say, OK, this is where we are, this is what we can do. And then on the point of um, scientific advice, one of the things that we all need to appreciate is, and this again will be well in, very well known to this audience, that many of the policy decisions that follow from the analysis of climate change are inevitably in the area of carbon emissions. How do we reduce the more than 10 gigatons of carbon that we're putting out into the atmosphere each year globally? Um, but if you're thinking about energy policy, then you need to think of it through three lenses, and this is identifying those lenses. Fortunately, it's not quite as many as the insects' lenses that we see here. Um, but they are the three lenses, and this is work from Cardiff, looking at um, uh, public attitudes again. So three quarters of respondents, and this is 2013, are very or fairly concerned about climate change. So that's the sustainability of the planet lens. Um, and 79% believe the UK should reduce its use of fossil fuels. But then 83% of the respondents were fairly or very concerned that in the next 10 or 20 years, electricity and gas will become unaffordable for them. So that's the affordability lens. And then finally, there's the security of supply lens, which is that 82% of the public have strong concerns about the UK becoming too dependent on energy from other countries. And of course, that's very a point at the moment. Um, and respondents were also concerned about having no alternatives in place when fossil fuels run out, um, and the possibility of a national petrol shortage and frequent power cuts. And if you are an elected politician looking at the responses that need to be made to the um, implications of climate change, then when you're thinking about energy, you have to be able to think about security of supply, sustainability, and affordability. And scientists can provide so much advice, but at the end of the day, 
there are political decisions to be made. And when we're having these discussions, we need to take account of public values. And I'll say a little bit in a second about fracking in that context, because I think it provides a very good case history of some of the opportunities and the challenges around communication. So people do have values about reducing the use of finite resources, of reducing overall levels of energy use. Um, but they also have very strong feelings about fairness. So if you look at the sort of series of values, avoiding waste, being efficient, capturing opportunities, social justice, fairness, honesty, and transparency, these matter, protecting the environment, the concept of what's natural and nature, the context of having a long-term view, long-term trajectories, things being interconnected, improvement. And then on the sort of security supply, availability and affordability, reliability, sorry, reliability and safety. And then the whole issue of personal autonomy and freedom and choice and control. And we have to understand these values. And I think it's quite interesting if you look at uh, the debate that there is about fracking at the moment, that there's the danger of two groups of people talking past each other. So if you're looking at this from a scientific and an engineering perspective, then the questions about fracking are about whether there'll be fugitive methane release, because if there's more than about 5% of fugitive methane release, then that really negates any greenhouse gas benefits. Um, they look at um, uh, seismicity, whether there'll be earth tremors or earthquakes. And then the other third area of concern is whether with all of the water that's injected for the hydraulic fracturing, there's the potential for contamination of water aquifers. And so my predecessor, John Beddington, asked the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering to do a report on looking at fracking from a safety and engineering a physical sciences basis. And they came up with the perfectly reasonable and widely replicated uh, conclusions that it is a drilling technology like other dr drilling technologies. It's been going actually as fracking since the 1940s. And if it is done well, then it is possible to minimize the risks of all three of those events happening. You can never reduce them to zero. And uh, there's always the potential to do it badly. But done well, supervised well, regulated well, fracking is an acceptable drilling technology for a fossil fuel. Um, but if you then ask the people that are protesting about that, what are they really protesting about? Then there are probably three different categories of protester. There's some people who are protesting because actually they don't like the use of fossil fuel full stop. There's another group who are protesting because they don't like big businesses. And then there's a third group that are protesting because not in my backyard. And I think there's the danger of failing to communicate and not recognizing that there are perhaps different concerns at play here. And that's the job of politicians to weigh up all of these concerns and work out how you balance. There are issues of equity. You frack in my backyard and the gas goes somewhere else. So there are all these issues around values and understanding what the concerns are. And if we're going to have the most effective public engagement, then we've actually got to bring this all together. And I feel fortunate in a way that my job is the scientific advisor, because I think it really is the politicians that have to look at that whole big picture. So that's enough, I think, from me. Um, communication is absolutely a two-way process. And I think what's absolutely clear is that um, my, I think my exhortation to the scientists in the audience is that I think if we want to have the best debate, then I really think it is important that as many scientists speak up about their science, and this doesn't just apply to climate and energy, it applies to science as a whole, if we're going to have good public discussion. And in spite of what people sometimes say, there's a lot of evidence that the public at all ages, publics, are very, very interested in science. What we have to do is to make the science interesting, engaging, and most of all, in a topic around energy and climate change, we have to give the very best evidence that we possibly can, because there are some of the hardest policy decisions that policymakers face anywhere around the planet at the moment. This is one of the defining challenges of our time. 
And I just finish on this piece of public engagement, which is from my colleague uh, David Mackay, the chief scientist at the um, Department of Energy and Climate Change, and the 2050 calculator, which he pioneered, and this in fact is an interface uh, for younger people, um, is an extraordinarily powerful way. It's openly available on the DEC website. It's now being replicated around the world. There's a 2050 calculator in Mandarin, openly available, hosted by the Chinese, and in fact there is now a global 2050 calculator that's being developed so that you can look at a global level as opposed to for this calculator which is at a national level for the UK. Um, so, um, going back to the title, um, success or failure? Um, I think it's a bit of both is the answer. I think that actually if you look at the public it's clear there has been an enormous amount of communication. Um, here's some communication just in the last uh, few days about a paper in Nature Climate Change, um, heavier summer downpours with climate change revealed by weather forecast resolution model, um, and the, some of the coverage that came around that paper. There is an enormous amount of interest in this, and I think it's our duty to communicate it as effectively as we possibly can. Thank you for your attention. Well, uh, thank you very much for a very stimulating and thought-provoking presentation. And in the spirit of two-way communication, I'd like to open the floor for some questions. Hi, uh, my name's Barry Woods. Um, I'm a member of the public, but I, I do have a friend at the Walker Institute, so partly why I'm here. Um, you had a slide with climate change, 22% uh, not amongst the public. And things like nuclear was 45% or something like that. Electricity was less understood, economics and policy was less understood. I think Chris Rapley said that a lot of times people are talking about science, they're actually talking about policy. So, you know, the, the science is understood. I mean, what would, you know, we've, the science has been successfully communicated. What is being argued about with the fracking debate is policy. So, so I think, you know, you know, say we had perfect climate science communication. What is the expectation that would happen next? People suddenly agree on policy? Um, no, I, I, I mean, I, firstly, I agree with you completely. I, a lot of the public concern is about policy. Um, but if we're going to have the best policy debate, then it needs to be had in the context of the best information about the science. But the science is, as I illustrated, fracking, always only going to be part of that policy debate. That, that's, not, that's not climate science, though. Hmm? Is that, that's not climate science. That's, a, that's completely different. Field. It's like engineering or geology or... Well, I, um, most of the policy consequences of climate change come from the policy decisions that we make about energy. Yeah, but that's nothing to do with atmospheric physics. So climate science has been communicated, as they say, one to four degrees this century, uncertainty at either end. So the policy choice is where the issue is. So why communicate climate science. It just seems confused. Okay, because the, because the imperative for the policy, for making policy decisions, is the fact that we have a world, the climate of which is changing, and understanding that that is one of the drivers for the policy decisions is extremely important. In other words, if there was no change in the climate, then there would be no need to take policy decisions about the burning of fossil fuels. Thank you. Um, Jamie from COIN, Climate Outreach Information Network. We've been doing a lot of work around communication, and it's great to hear what you're saying because people do tend to work back from their values and what they see is happening out there and then working out if they believe in the science. So I suppose my question to you, and, and we've been doing a lot of work on this on the ground and recently produced a report on how the IPCC could be communicated better, um, get it from a website, but um, why do you think um, this has taken so long to become an issue that scientists are now debating and seeing how the social science element, the understanding of how people are engaged with the issues has taken this long and why is it still quite a difficult discussion to be had or maybe you don't think it is? Oh well I think it is a difficult discussion to be had for the reason that actually that gentleman just alluded to which is that there are some extremely difficult policy decisions so it is a difficult discussion and these are policy decisions that affect people's lives. Um, on the on the emphasis to social, of social science, I think there has been active social science investigation of this for some time. Um, I think that the whole field of 
the communication of science is one that has matured, but it, I think a lot of that maturation happened many years ago. It, there was traditionally the deficit model of public engagement. In other words, uh, they're all a bit ignorant out there. What we'll do is we'll educate them. Um, and that really is, was never the correct answer. Um, people are very smart, and it is actually about engaging them. And if you want to communicate effectively, if you want to teach people, you actually have to understand, as it were, where they're coming from. And so, um, but I think that it, I think that this and other discussions emphasize the fact that we need an awful lot of social science. And I actually find that in my day-to-day -day job, I need social science input at least as much as I need other forms of scientific input. Thank you. Mike Moorcroft, Natural England. Um, I'm a scientist, broadly speaking, who does quite a lot of advice to policymakers and conservation practitioners. And for the most part, that's fine and straightforward. But every now and again, often sort of out of left field from the public, one comes across the outright climate skeptic stroke denier. And I'm always, I find myself torn between whether I should engage and spend time with that person or whether it's a lost cause and a waste of my time and to move on. And I guess you get a similar issue, probably at a higher level. And I'm interested in what you do about those sort of people with very strong views. Um, it's quite hard to look at any issue that excites people and not find that there will be single issue activists. And so this isn't, it isn't just about uh, climate science, it's about uh, GM technologies, it's about homeopathy, it's about there are all sorts of issues where there is uh, a, a great body of scientific evidence and then there are some people that come at it from a strong belief position. And I think the answer is that you do have to engage and you do have to talk, but there comes a point at which you have to say, well, we'll have to agree to disagree. Um, and we do live in a plural society. People have all sorts of beliefs. And that's the great thing about democracy. And it's one of the reasons why actually the job of communicating to politicians and to policymakers is so important. And I think it's another reason, which is that, you know, when people get, people sometimes say, well, it's somewhat crossly to me, why aren't there more scientists in politics? Well, actually, you can't blame the politicians that are there because they stood. Um, and so I think how scientists engage with the democratic process is incredibly important as well. And it's another reason it's important to have this sort of and other discussions, because actually, ultimately, politicians are responsive to the voting public. I'm Emmanuel from the Natural Resources Institute at the University of Greenwich. I'm a postgraduate student. Um, thank you for talking about the issues of framing and relevance and as well, local content in information that you know makes people engage better with this um, climate change information. My question is, um, you know, it has to do with the length of information. For instance, the IPCC turns out, you know, lots of pages once every five to six years, and you find that majority of people of the public do not really get to read most of these things. And then you find um, some writers, journalists, summarizing information for people. Now, in summarizing such huge quantities of information, you find that some important points are getting missing from, from the main thing. Now, how do we balance out the issue of overwhelming, of like, like flooding the public with so much information and you know having to get journalists summarize these things in ways that probably wouldn't be of benefit or convey the information as accurate as possible. Thank you. Um, OK, well, I, th I think there's actually two questions embedded in that. So as far as the IPCC is concerned, actually, the, they, they do it rather well, because there is the three kilogram version. There's the summary for policymakers, of which is about 40 or 50 pages. And then actually, certainly for working group one, there was the two side version of the report which distilled the key messages. So uh, you have to recognize that there are different levels of communication for different audiences. But I think actually the IPCC process this time has achieved that rather well. I think there's a second question, which is whether an IPCC process that says um, there's just a, a pulse of, you know, there's an enormous amount of activity in between, but the model is you produce a report every five years. I think there is debate about that for the future um, as to whether we don't need more frequent, perhaps less wordy updates. So I think there is a, uh, there, I think there's a question and a debate about that at the moment. But in terms of the mode of communication, I think actually the IPCC has done rather well this time in terms of producing reports of different lengths for different audiences. 
Uh, Keith Clark, Forum for the Future and Institute of Civil Engineers. Um, a sort of question about optimism, really. The, the, it would appear we've had enough local disasters we're worried about adaptation. Do you believe we'll transition into serious mitigation, or will we just dig a bigger carbon hole in adaptation? Um, well, as, as John Holdren put it, we have a choice. We can mitigate, we can adapt, or we can suffer. And the truth is we're going to have to do all three. Um, so, yes, we have to do all of the above, I think, hoping to minimise the suffering. So you're optimistic? Of course I'm optimistic. Hi, my name is Danny Weston. Uh, I represent myself. Uh, I've got a question about one of the things you said in the talk, Mark. Uh, you said one of the areas of consensus was it's, it's going to be bad. Now, I take you as meaning that the catastrophic scenarios are going to be more likely. That's not the impression I've got from reading AR5 myself. Uh, and let me quote you, the main line of evidence for the catastrophic scenarios uh, are the models. And in a technical summary, it says in AR5, the scenarios should be considered plausible and illustrative and do not have probabilities attached to them. So on that basis, how can you say that there's a consensus saying that it's likely? I'm sorry to say that I think the bad falls a long way short of catastrophic. There are a lot of very bad outcomes. Uh, catastrophic outcomes are a lot worse. Uh, yeah, I thought that was a, a very interesting talk. My name's Ken Wright from the Department of Energy and Climate Change, so I'm a fellow government science advisor and part of the uh, least trusted group on your chart, unfortunately. Um, but we are, we are, we are, you, you've got to look at this in terms of context. Well, my, it's about. exactly what my question is. It's to do with... How, who you're communicating to, because your talk concentrated on how you're communicating, but it's interesting that the doom messages don't play very well to the general public because people feel slightly helpless in the way that they can potentially respond and they need to be given a kind of, if that's a story, then what can I actually do? But I'd be interested in your views and how you communicate, as you were just mentioning, to policymakers and to, to to politicians, not just in the UK but internationally, and whether you feel like you need to rein yourself in on the doom messaging or whether you feel that there, there's a need for a more of a reality check because they're actually in a power, they're in a position to actually achieve more in the international negotiations process. But I, I mean, again, it comes back to my answer to the previous uh, man's question, which is, which is, you know, doom and catastrophe are extremely strong words. Things can be bad without actually uh, doom and catastrophe. So I think that, you know, the job of the scientific advisor is very clear. It is to give the best possible evidence we can, recognizing often you're advising in circumstances of uncertainty when events are unfolding. Um, so, uh, you know, during the floods, answering the question of how much longer the rain would go on for is a very difficult question to answer. You go to the Met Office and they give you the best advice they can, but there is always uncertainty. Um, but uh, I can only speak for UK politicians because that's my remit, but UK politicians do listen. Um, and uh, the important thing is to have a very straight conversation and I'm absolutely clear and, and the Prime Minister is clear he didn't hire me to tell him what he wanted to hear he hired me to give him the best scientific advice um, and he also didn't hire me for me to tell him what the policy should be that's his job um, I wanted to ask you about relevance, which was a, a, a word that you... Sorry, it's Emily Shukra from the Presenter. Oh, well, I, was, well, I hope I quoted you accurately, Emily. <laughs> um, you mentioned relevance a number of times throughout your talk, and in fact, actually, one of your sides said that science alone is not enough. Communication, which is visually interesting, humorous, or relevant to people's daily lives, is more effective. Um, and, and I guess I wanted to um, get your thoughts on how we construct messages that are relevant. My experience for example, with the business world, um, is that many people in the business world um, really woke up to this as being an issue when Carbon Tracker took the carbon budget, which was um, a scientific result, and translated the implications of that in terms of what that meant um, in, in, for... Um, and global reserves of coal, oil and gas and whether or not governments and uh, global markets were there for um, overvaluing companies that were treating unburnable um, reserves as assets. So that was an example of the science being translated in a way that's more relevant. What, how, how do you think we can do that more effectively and um, across a broader range of different end applications? Um I think in all sorts of different ways. So we have to, for example, use units that are relevant to people's understanding. And so when we talk about um, a petagram, 
uh, that's not something that means anything really to anyone. When we talk about a gigaton, what does that mean? When we talk about a billion tons, it starts meaning something. And when you show someone what a ton of carbon looks like or a ton of carbon dioxide differently, then that starts. So I think it's about finding units that are relevant to people. It's about finding metaphors that are relevant to people. Um, it's probably finding ways, and I think that's the strength of the 2050 calculator which people can explore in ways that, again, mean something to them. You know, how many wind, how many wind turbines do you actually need uh, if you were going to power 50% of the um, electricity power that's needed at the moment? So I think it's about finding different ways in which one can express the science in ways that mean something to individuals. And obviously that depends on the context, whether it's business or individuals. I don't think I can do any better than that. I think you could probably answer the question just as well as me. Uh, do you broadly agree? I guess my question was more institutionally, how do we do it? How do we put in place? So, so, so a lot of, you know, if you're really going to achieve this well, then, then it does, to pick up another point of yours, require engagement and dialogue between different groups. You had a cartoon um, which was demonstrating that unless you sort of spoke people's language and understood their interests, then that communication wasn't going to work. So how do we institutionally try to facilitate those kind of conversations to generate um, information and senses relevant. So you have to make it relevant to the particular institution. Of course, my job is to make the science relevant to the institution that is government. And so it is actually, in a sense, to relate it to the policy questions that government have to take and to relate it to the discussions that go on between governments. So I think, in the, in you, I think you have to analyse the institution. You pick business. The institution I deal with is government. And so my communication has to be relevant to the institution of government. And government is ultimately about governance. So it is actually about the things that matter for policy. And those are the things that, that um, politicians are interested in. And so, as it were, going, again, going back to the sort of the end of the world metaphors, going to um, any politician and saying that, you know, X will happen in 30 years' time is no interest at all until you can start telling them what that means for policies now. So I think it is actually about making it relevant to whatever the institution is. And different institutions will have uh, different levers that will make them more or less interested. And then, of course, there's a separate set of levers, which is the levers you want to pull if you want to achieve institutional change. And again, that's for government to think about in terms of how it makes policy. What levers does it want to pull? Hello. Uh, my name is David Carpenter from the University of Oxford. Um, I, I thought um, one of the most interesting slides was the one where you uh, showed a steady decline in uh, trust in almost all uh, forms of uh, public institutions, including uh, what you called independent scientists, um, media, government scientists, through 2006, 2011. Um, and that was specifically labelled climate change. I wondered if you'd, um, in your work as... Uh, uh, scientific advisor come across similar patterns in other uh, levels of trust in government messages. Um, sorry, could and, 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 and if so, whether they're showing the same the same sorts of patterns, and whether this might be um, a symptom of a of an overall decline in uh, in trust in the things which uh, people in the past uh, have relied on. Um, I think that's a good question, and I don't have the controls for that, so I don't know the answer. But actually, if you look at the last year's survey and the overall level of trust in, in scientists, it's actually very high at the moment. So I'm not sure whether that secular decline is actually reflected in other areas. Uh, but it's a good question. Where, where are the controls? And I didn't have them. So I don't know. Good note to end on. OK, right. Well, on that note, we will finish. And I'd like to thank Sir Mark for a really stimulating presentation. Um, so we'd like to thank him again. Thank you. And, and we can go downstairs now for a reception. And uh, while we're in a medical institution, I think it's quite appropriate, and I don't want to enforce discussions on people, but to think about how different disciplines and different communities talk about communication of science. How do the medical community do it? What can we learn in the climate community from medics, from other disciplines, and so on? And it's an opportunity to have that sort of discussion. Right, thank you.